So welcome to this video where the topic is describing and shaping flows. So the purpose of this video is to give you an understanding of simple mechanisms for describing flows, how flows can be shaped using leaking and token bucket, and how this can be used for resource reservation. And then you will also learn about basic me mechanisms to ensure quality of service at the network layer in what is called integrated and differentiated services. Some similar mechanisms for describing and shaping flows. Uh, first of all, a host computer application might produce packets in some unregulated packet flow. This is often the case that you don't have a nice steady transmission of packets. However, we don't want the packets to go into the network faster than they can be transmitted. So we might want to queue it either in the host or in a gateway and send it uh, according to when the connection is available. We can also use this for our queuing policies to give, for example, a limited burst, um, a limited but bursty flow, a fair quality uh, of service. That is, for example, the case when we have the web surfing. Is if you're you, if you're sharing your internet connection with your little brother who is using peer to peer, and you are just surfing the web, then how to make the fair distribution? It might be that even if your web traffic is bursty in limited uh, amounts of time that then whenever you have this small burst from getting a web page, then that whole burst should have a high priority um, compared to, to his peer-to-peer -peer traffic. So there might be places where we don't want to favor, um, you can say, steady flows, but want to give the bursty flows also a chance. So if we have just specified bandwidth available, this can be a, a simple leaky pocket. Um, I will show you here. So a host computer or application, it might produce packets in this unregulated packet flows that we discussed before. The, le the leaky bucket model is like, as I said, a bucket with a hole in it. So the packet arrives, this is what you see, they arrive from the host computer in some unregulated flow, and they fall into the bucket as they arrive, but they cannot leave that bucket faster than the drip out of the, of the bucket in the end. So, Two things that characterizes the leaky bucket is first of all its capacity, so how many packets can fit into the bucket, and secondly, how fast they can leave, or the sending rate, which is usually packets per second or a bit per second. So you also need, of course, to know what happens if your bucket is overflowing, but usually you would just uh, lose this data uh, because your buffer would be full when the packet arrives. Then another model uh, is what is called the token bucket. Uh, the problem with the leaky bucket is that it has no memory, so it doesn't allow really for descri describing or generating bursty traffic. This is what we can do with the token bucket. So in the token bucket, the, regulated, um, the flow is regulated by tokens. This means that whenever there are tokens available in the token bucket, it will be sent straight away. Uh, and if there are no tokens available in the bucket when the packet arrives, then it has to wait for additional tokens to arrive. So what happens in this way is that when you have a number of packets arriving, so assume you have five packets in your token bucket, you have 10 packets arriving all at the same time, then the first five packets, they will be sent straight away, and the rest, the remaining five packets, they will be sending as the tokens arrive. So this gives you the advantage that you have this ability to put in a burst. Uh, so how to describe it is that we describe it by using the arrival rate of the tokens and the capacity of how many tokens can be stored. And then you can of course also say that you have a capacity of how many packets can actually be stored when waiting for tokens. So that would correspond to the buffer we had before. What we often want to do is to have a token bucket dripping into a leaky bucket. Um, so with the token bucket, we can describe uh, bursted traffic. Um, as I said before, uh, this is a similar example. So if the capacity is, for example, 100 packets, it means that if a, a burst arrives, then the first 100 packets of this um, burst will be sent straight away. Then whatever follows will be sent at the rate at which the token arrives. Um, so that is if the bucket is full when we start. If we already had used some of the tokens, then the, we can say the, uh, the burst that we can accommodate also become, become smaller. 
However, this might not be realistic, uh, because even though we are accepting birds, we cannot send them out of the network uh, by unlimited uh, speed or bandwidth. So, for example, we might have a connection of 2 megabit per second, but we allow to, the burst to be up to 10 megabit per second for 30 seconds of time. Uh, and the way we can model this is actually by having this token pocket, which is dripping into the leaky pocket. And what I'm looking for here is, of course, that we have this, um, when we define the burst here, it's a burst up to a certain speed. Um, so that would be the speed of the leaky pocket that we are dripping into. So the example we have here is, um, is uh, different cases. So first of all, we have uh, input to a leaky bucket. That's the A in the figure here, where the traffic is arriving uh, steady state for 40 uh, milliseconds in this case. Then we see in B the output from a, from a, from a leaky bucket, where, where the leaky bucket is 2 uh, megabit per second for, let's say, 500 milliseconds. Then we look at the output from the token. Depending on the different capacities um, of the token bucket. So now we just assume that we have a token bucket um, uh, with no leaky bucket underneath it. So depending on how many of the capacity, so the, depending on how many tokens we have in the token bucket, we can see that we get different results. So uh, if we only have 250, then in the beginning the, the traffic will drop through the token bucket as fast as it arrives. But whenever the bird is being used, then it stops, then it stops dripping through at that rate, and it will only um, leave it with the rate where the token arrives. Uh, and yes, there are three different versions of that. And then in the last figure, what we see is then the token pocket, which is feeding into the leaky pocket. And the main thing you can notice here is that in the beginning, before, um, when we only had the token pocket, then all the traffic that arrived was dripping through at the same speed as it arrived with, but now we are limiting that speed by the using the token pocket. And of course, then we also are using uh, uh, doing this for a longer period of time, as you can also see. So by combining the leaky and token pocket, we, we have a good flexibility in how to, to, um, to model and how to describe the bursts. One of the things this can be used for is for reservation of resources. And that is, for example, defined in the RSVP protocol, which is also known as integrated services. Um, it's not widely used uh, because there are some challenges that I will also uh, say, and you can see them here in the slide. Uh, first of all, you need to define what kind of resources you need to reserve. Um, and this you can do by describing a number of parameters. And what we saw was uh, with the token bucket and the leaky bucket is quite useful here. Um, however, there are some points of criticism to this resource reservation. First of all, it can be resource demanding to reserve resources in a system with a lack of capacity. And it's only if you have a lack of capacity you really want to reserve resources. So this uh, resource reservation can in itself add to the, to the overhead and therefore reduce the, um, um, you can say, reduce the efficiency of the system. It takes also time to set up a connection with, and it makes it more uh, sensitive to network errors and other weaknesses that we know from the circuit switch networks. That if there is just a single error or if there is a congested link or if a node is going down then you need to set up the connection again. And there's also so a risk that connections are blocking each other so when you set up the connection, you don't know what will be the future demand. So that can again lead to a bad usage of available resources. Moreover, for resource reservation to really make sense is that you need to do it globally. So you need to reserve the resources all the way from the sender to the receiver. And it's a global internet with different providers, uh, with different uh, peer providers, different networks that you're passing through, uh, the likeliness that you can have a global uh, system supporting it is just really small. So in fact it's not very used. What you can do though is that you can use differentiated services or assured forwarding. So um, in differentiated services you, you differ between what is called explicit forwarding and then assured forwarding. 
So when with expedited forwarding, we simply do a kind of priority. So we could say that we have expedited packets and regular packets. It's simple. Uh, what we need to decide is who marks the packets. So who decide what is priority and where do we decide what is priority. But it's useful for, for example, voice or IP in a company network because you can put it, give it a higher priority. Um, it's more tricky to do it in the in the more global internet because then who has decide who is to decide which package should have the higher priority and what should be the business model behind it and who is to pay for it again when passing through different networks uh, and it might be difficult to to find someone to send the bill to. Then you have the assured forwarding, which is more complex but also much more flexible in the sense that many different policies can be implemented. So here you have uh, your packet. Your packet goes through a classifier where you can put it into different uh, priority classes. Of course, you need to be able to do this classification, um, which can in itself be tricky. Then depending on which priority class you go through, you mark it differently. So the different priority classes will have different markers. And then you put it into a shaper, or draw, shaper slash dropper, where you will have different policies implemented. So it could be that you have uh, class one, which is the most important, which you will always prioritize. And in this class one, you always send it when uh, first, whenever. The problem with doing this is that then you might exhaust some of the other classes. So you might also want to have some fixed percentage divided for each class, but that can also lead to inefficiency if you are not able to utilize it all for the class. So in general, you have here that the simpler you keep it, um, the easier it is to implement, but also the more limited and you uh, get into some pitfalls, but the more complex you make it, uh, the harder it is to implement and can also be more resource consuming. But this is a full topic in itself, how to do all this queuing. Um, IP in IPv4, then the different set of services are supported using the TOS field. So looking at the header here, we see that there are some bits reserved for it, and there are some different RFCs, which is request for comments, which you can check out in order to understand um, how, you can, how you can use it.